about knowing your enemy and understanding the biology of mice helps you deal with or understand why there's such a problem. It's a little bit late now because a lot of you have sown your crops, but it's, it's good to store away for next time you're sowing crops. The critical considerations in the lead up to sowing. I'm going to talk a lot about creating an unfriendly environment in your paddocks for mice before you bait. Because if you can make things uncomfortable for the mice before you apply bait, it gives them the best chance to get out and find that lethal dose. And that's what it's all about. And particularly in zero and no-till systems where we have lots of food, lots of shelter, lots of cover for mice, a very complex environments, we're putting bait out into these environments, it's actually quite difficult for the mouse to find the bait and get that lethal dose. And then I'm going to bang on a fair bit about um, the latest research that we've been doing, remembering that all of this work is funded by the GRDC because they've taken the time to acknowledge that mice are an ongoing problem for farmers and we need to be more strategic about the way we deal with them because we've only, at the moment we've only got one tool in the shed so we've got to use it the best possible way. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about baits and the effectiveness of baits because that's the, the highlight of some recent research that we've just brought out. Uh, and then talk about some other work that our group at CSIRO are doing. So next slide, please, Camilla. Okay, so as I was saying, through the, the heart of the mouse outbreak has basically been from Dubbo north to the, to, to the Queensland border. Um, and you know, guys there have been significantly impacted with total losses of summer crops. Uh, we've just spent a couple of days doing some tours around looking at, at um, fodder storages and in some cases there have been total decimation of fodder storages. Uh, one farm in particular lost, well, had 3,000 bales so badly contaminated that they just set them on fire. So that's a $120,000 loss on one property. As times progressed, um, the mouse problem has continued to get worse further south, so through parks, uh, I've just come through through Went Wellington. There's heaps of mice in Wellington at the moment. Um, and then as you move further south into the Riverina, northern Victoria and across onto the York Peninsula in South Australia, they're all reporting higher numbers of mice, particularly in southern New South Wales as they've been draining the rice crop in preparation for harvest. The mice are really starting to become quite prominent there. So there's some real issues through a much broader area than we expected and it seems to be continuing on. Uh, interestingly, over in, in Western Australia, where mice traditionally aren't a, a major problem, uh, we're getting reports of really high numbers from ravens and slop in, in the south of South Australia, which is a little bit unusual, but it happens from time to time over there. Thanks, Camilla. Okay, some facts about mice. And you'll excuse me, my voice is, is dying. The mice, you, the mice you have in your paddock are, <laughs> are mus, domest, mus musculus domesticus. Um, they're the same mice that are in the city. They're the same mice that are in your house in the country. They're the same mice that are in your paddock. They're the same mice that are basically everywhere that humans are. They start breeding when they're six weeks old and they can have a litter of six to 10 pups every 19 to 21 days after they start breeding. But the real kicker is that as soon as they put that first litter on the ground, they can fall pregnant again with the second litter. So while they're feeding the first litter, they're gestating the second litter, they wean the first litter, give birth to the second litter. So there's no break in pup production. And one of the real issues is that when you get a conditions, in climatic conditions like this, where there's lots of food, lots of shelter, lots of moisture, you get really high level of survival of the offspring. And so all of those offspring go on to produce pups. And so you can imagine if you've got 100 mice per hectare at some stage and you're saying, well, 100 mice per hectare, that's not too bad. In, if 50 of those are having babies, in three, six, nine weeks, you've got a monumental problem. Now, the, the, the 
throwaway fact that people put out there is that a single pair of mice can give rise to 500 offspring in a season. I don't know how they calculate that, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty daunting stat. Um, breeding starts in spring and will continue through to autumn if conditions are favourable. And I don't think anybody would, would contest that conditions haven't been favourable this year. It's been a beautiful, moist, mild summer. Um, the autumn got a little bit dry towards the end, but it's still been mild and pretty warm. Today it's not though, it's miserable. Um, but it has been generally warm. Um, and our concern now is that mice will continue to breed through the autumn into the winter. Breeding will slow down through the winter time. But if we get a high level of overwinter survival, then next spring, when they start breeding again, they'll start breeding from a higher population base. And that means that numbers will go high again very quickly. Now, the major concern about that is I, I'm guessing that most people have sown into what was just about a full profile of water, which means that we can probably, without too much in-crop rainfall, expect an average crop or better. If we, get, if we get average rainfall, we're going to get a really good crop. And so that's the scenario that's going to provide really good conditions for mice next spring. So we're hoping that, that, that will, populations will fall through the winter. But, but what I'm saying is that farmers will really need to continue to monitor their mice, monitor their crops through the winter time, so they know what's going on in the spring and be prepared to, to bait early in the spring to try and take that breeding potential out of the population. Um, and yeah, of course, if conditions are favourable, we know that the, the rate of increase is exponential. Thanks. I hear lots of stuff about predators controlling mice. If only we had more owls, if only we had more raptors, if only we had more snakes. Oh, who said that? <laughs> um, anecdotal reports of raptors both nocturnal and diurnal controlling mouse plagues are not right. It's fantastic to have them. They're great to have in the system, but they don't regulate mouse populations. And what tends to happen is you get an increase in mice. That creates conditions that are favourable for an increase in predators. They increase sort of in a delay. When mouse numbers crash, all that food disappears out of the system, predators crash and you get this boom-bust cycle. We've got to try and get away from this idea of thinking that there's some sort of a balance in nature and everything you know, sort of moves along at this level. We live in a boom-bust world where things ebb and flow and we don't get equilibrium or balanced nature. Everything goes up and down. It's the same with your crops and, and those sorts of things. So the presence of, of these species won't, won't prevent a mouse outbreak but they are really helpful in take, taking animals. Uh, there's a study done on the York Peninsula a few years ago. Um, this, it was done by a student. She put up uh, owl boxes around cropping paddocks and put cameras on the owl boxes and monitored how often owls brought mice to the nest. Um, at one stage in a pretty reasonable outbreak, they were, they were bringing a mouse every 15 minutes to the nest, which is kind of cool, but it's not gonna regulate your mouse mouse outbreak. Um, but yeah, lovely to have them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about secondary poisoning um, while we're talking about raptors um, because it's a really important concern. Zinc phosphide that you use to control mice in your paddocks works by the phosphide being converted to phosphine in the acid environment in the mouse's stomach. That gets taken up into the bloodstream and then goes off and damages the major organs of the mouse, principally the liver. And, and when the mouse dies, any of that phosphine gas that hasn't been converted and, and used to, to kill the mouse dissipates out into the environment. So, but it goes off as a gas. So when the raptors come along and scavenge that mouse that's been killed by zinc phosphide, not other toxins, just zinc phosphide, the chances of it getting secondary poisoning are very, very low. So it makes it a quite a good chemical to use on a broad scale. The situation for anticoagulants that you use around your house are very different. 
So those toxins build up in the animal and they cause the animal to in internally hemorrhage and, and bleed to death, but the toxin remains in the animal after it's died. So if they're scavenged by your cats and dogs or birds of prey, there's a good chance that they'll be, if they eat enough of, of the poisoned animals, there's a good chance that they will suffer the same level of poisoning as, to, as the target animal. So secondary poisoning is an issue for those toxins that you use around your houses. And if you're get, finding sick and, and dead animals that are poisoned by anticoagulants, you need to pick them up, remove them, bury them, put them in the rubbish, get rid of them somehow so they're not available to poison other animals. Um, while I'm ranting and raving about stuff, and I hope I'm not wandering out of camera too much, um, no, there's no Khaleesi virus for mice. Uh, Grant Singleton and his team did some terrific work profiling um, diseases in mice and, and we just haven't found some. We are going to ask some questions about disease profiles in mouse populations over the next few years, um, but that is helping us to understand how those diseases interact within the population and whether they might be driving mouse populations to crash. And if we understand those interactions between the diseases and the other factors that lead to crashes, we might have a better understanding about why, how they work and when populations will crash, because that'll help us in terms of control strategies and those sorts of things. Next slide, please. Okay, things to consider prior to sowing, and I know you've, most of you have probably finished sowing, but we'll go through them anyway. Do you know what's happening in your stubbles? Do you know how many mice are in your stubbles? Um, one of the things where I get a bit rude, I tell farmers they've got to get out of the ute, get off their ass, go for a walk in the paddock and work out how many mice they've got. It's no good driving through your stubbles and saying, oh, I think I've got a few mice. Um, I do it. I make that mistake myself. I, I get there and say, oh, let's work out how many there are. We'll go for a drive. It's a dumb thing to do. In zero no-till systems where there's lots of stubble, lots of trash, that is really hides the sign of mouse activity. I get confronted with the situation where, you know, in 2016, 2017, we were warning farmers about a potential outbreak and, and damage at the 2017 sowing, and we started to talk about it in the spring of 2016. We get right through to farmers actually starting to sow their paddocks in 2017, and particularly in some barley stubbles, because 2016 had been a big harvest, they pulled in, couldn't get their machinery through the stubbles, pulled out, burnt their stubbles, and they said, oh my God, where did all these mice come from? They just didn't know they were there because the, the trash from the previous crop had been hiding the sign. So what I do is I get out of the ute, I walk 100 metres straight down a furrow line, I count all the active burrows for one metre wide strip along 100 metres. So you're counting active burrows per 100 metres. Don't be tempted to add one burrow in that's just outside your transect, because if you add one burrow in, you're adding 100 burrows per hectare. I walk 400 metres, I average the number of burrows per 100 metres, and then I multiply up to give me burrows per hectare. If you've got one burrow per 100 square metres, you've got 100 burrows per hectare. Doesn't sound like too many, if you've got two mice per burrow, you've got 200 mice per hectare. Still doesn't sound like a heck of a lot. If all of those, or if 100 of those have six babies every 21 days for, for, six, for nine weeks, you've got a hell of a problem. So what I'm saying is you go from the point where you don't think you have too many to a big problem really fast. And so at the point where you're thinking, oh, I've probably got a few, you've probably got the start of a problem. So yeah, get out, go for a work, walk, work out what's happening in your stubbles in, well ahead of sowing. Are all your stubbles the same? I'd say no. I would say that, um, and, and what farmers report to us really often is uh, paddocks that have had barley in them, in particular, where you get a lot of head bust off uh, in the lead up to harvest, um, 
they're often paddocks where you have a problem in the subsequent year in the stubble of those paddocks because there's lots of food on the ground. Uh, reports from the Wimmera over the last couple of years where they had a big wind event in the lead up to, to harvest. Um, in, in some areas they lost a tonne to a tonne and a half per hectare during those wind events prior to the header going through. That equates to 2,200 seeds per square metre. And I'll tell you why that's a problem in a couple of slides time, but that's a heck of a lot of mouse food. Um, so we talked about calculating how many mice there are. We talked about the stubbles not being the same. Will the mice still be there when you're sowing your crop? My word, they will, because we know that that monumental rain event just prior to Easter, it didn't take them all out. We know that there's been a few frosts over the last couple of months. The mice are still running across the road in the daytime around Wellington. So mice are really good survivors. If you've got them in high numbers in the autumn, they're still going to be there when you're sowing the crop, unless you've had a monumental crash in the population. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about why all of that food is so important. Um, mice eat three grams of food, well, mice need three grams of food per day to survive. There are 22 gra grams, grains of food in a gram. Therefore, a mouse needs 66 grains per day. We just talked about that scenario of a tonne to the hectare of, on the ground, and that's not a heck of a lot. So that's 2,200 grains per square metre, and a mouse only needs 66 of those each day. So residual food is a monumental problem. So we, we just talked about what might have been lost before the header goes through. If you then start to think about what happens when the header goes through, and, and it's a bit difficult to do this because I'm not interacting with the audience, but I asked farmers how much food goes out the back of the header, and they all talk to me about oh, the colour of different headers and different headers shedding um, different amounts of grain. And for the people that are on camera, the guys in the audience are smiling and looking at each other now. So they're going, oh, not my header. <laughs> my header doesn't put anything out the back. <laughs> and, you know, when I ask this question in the evening, and uh, the last evening, and they say, oh, no, well, oh, I wouldn't put out too much. Wouldn't, wouldn't be too much. Uh, I talked to uh, someone from over in the Millawa, and that's a, like a two-tonne average system. So these guys are working pretty hard to get a crop. They're not they're high production systems. Um, they thought they had their header set up really, really well. But they thought they'd check it out and they bought those drop trays that you put up underneath the header, you drive along, you push a button, the tray drops off and the, you catch all the grain that's coming out the back of the header. They were putting out 300 kilos a hectare more than they thought they were. And that, I, I reckon that's not uncommon. So 300 kilos per hectare is a lot of food for mice. It's also about 100 bucks a hectare that you guys could be putting in the bin instead of putting it on the ground to feed mice. And if you're putting it in the bin, you're not having to spray it out next time you get a rainfall event as well. The other thing about those, those grain losses that I was talking about in the Wimmera is after one of those, those wind events and they've had a tonne of, of grain on the ground, they had 100 millimetres of rain through the summer. They still had ungerminated grain when they were sowing the crop the following autumn. And that's all food that's sitting in the system for mice. So unlike conventional tillage systems where you guys were cultivating to control weeds, create a, a seed bed and those sorts of things and you'd taken a lot of food and a lot of shelter out of the system. In zero no-till systems, that food's there all the time and it's providing a great resource for mice. Now, you wouldn't trade off zero and no-till for any money at all because you know, the water retention that you get is, is, is unbeatable. I, I talk to farmers about zero and no-till 
and times that in the past they wouldn't have got the header out of the shed and they're now breaking even. So it's a fantastic, excellent, sustainable system, but we need to find ways to be more strategic about the way we control mice in these systems. Next slide, please. Um, again, I generally ask questions for this slide, so I'm going to have to pro <laughs> prompt myself. If you've got sheep as part of your system, some people do, some people don't. Uh, now that sheep are worth a buck, a lot more people have got sheep than they used to. Uh, in parts of the southern cropping zone, though, you know, lots of farmers have pulled out all their fences, gone just pure cropping, and it makes it difficult to use sheep as a, as a technique to reduce residual food. If you've got them, use them in your stubbles. Reduce the food. Spray out your germinations. You do that anyway to conserve moisture. It's a fantastic way to re reduce food for mice. This one's a bit of a, a touchy one and I'm reluctant to talk about it because I don't think I'd have the nerve to do it. But if you've got high numbers of your mice in your stubble in the summertime, they're probably not doing any harm. And they're also reducing the residual food that's in the paddock. So that later in the, in the crop, or sorry, later as you prepare to sow your crop and you prepare to bait, there's a lot less food around so that you get a really good result with your bait. But I'm not sure that I'm brave enough to leave mice running around in my paddocks at really high levels. Um, so if you remember that a tonne is 2,200 grains per square metre, um, zinc phosphide bait is spread at one kilogram per hectare, which is three grains per square metre. That's a whole lot of competition for the attention of the mouse. If you've got, and I'm, you know, not, there's not a 3,000 or 2,000 dots here, but you can see if you've got less residual grain, it's much easier for the mouse to find a lethal dose. And it's a pretty basic concept, but it's really, really important. Because the way mice are working is they, they want to find those 66 grains that they need each night as fast as they can because while they're up on the surface and cruising around there's a chance that they'll be eaten by something else. So if you make it easy for them to find those three grains you've got a much better chance of getting a good result with your bait application. The other thing while I'm talking about mice feeding and moving and doing those sorts of things we want to try and get away from the concept that mice move across the landscape in a wave just eating everything in front of them. What Moving for a mouse, you know, mice weigh 13 grams. Moving for a mouse is actually a really dangerous thing to do. So each night they pop up on the surface and they get as much food as they can from close by their, their burrow, scurry back down where they're safe. As mouse numbers get higher and higher, they have to range further and further to get their food. At some point it becomes too dangerous to go back to the burrow, so they find shelter where they are. Population moves on. When you've got huge numbers of mice, they're depleting that food much earlier or much quicker, and so they're tending to be moving on much quicker, but they're not moving across the landscape in a wave like we think they are from one place to the next. So you can tell the Victorians when they ring and abuse you that it's not your mice that are moving south, it's their mice that are building in numbers. So, <laughs> yeah, we're trying to get away from that, that concept. Next slide, please. Uh, again, I've been talking about you know, zero no-till systems and finding ways to be more strategic. Um, work that we've done down south um, shows that mice are now living in the paddocks. They used to live on the margins of paddocks and invade those paddocks from the margins when conditions were favourable because cultivation meant that there was a high level of disturbance, not much shelter, not much food, and it probably explains why people got such good results with zinc phosphide when it was first brought out, because it was going into a situation where there was no other food around, no shelter, it was really easy for the mice to find that bait. Um, now mice are living in the paddock all year round in a really complex environment. Um, and of course, food grain, grain is available um, both before and after harvest. Incidentally, when, when mice run out of grain, they, you know, they'll browse, browse growing shoots. They'll also um, eat insects and those sorts of things as well. So they're real omnivores and, and um, generals. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
please forget about these charts on the right hand side here. This is just an example of how little food supports, still supports quite a lot of mice. What we did is we, we tracked how food um, is reduced in paddocks after harvest. We put out little quadrats, we scraped up all the ground cover, all the grain and stuff, sieved them out and, and counted grains. In this paddock, there was about 150 kilos of grain left after harvest when we first started counting. So the, the guy driving the header had done a really good job. Incidentally, when I was talking about headers and shedding grain before, one of the factors that, that, that causes grain to come out the back of the header is the driver. Uh, different drivers have different attitudes to the speed at which they drive the header. Um, and apparently at lunchtime and, and um, dinner time, when the header driver changes, the, um, the rate of loss goes down. And it's something to do with the gender of the driver that makes the loss go down. So, <laughs> so I think you, you guys are getting the message about speed. <laughs> Um, but in this paddock where there was 150 kilos left, that's enough for 50,000 mouse days. So I'm going to keep banging on about food. Um, next slide, please. All right, I want to talk about some work that, that we did in the lab in response to, um, to farmers talking to me about the lack of efficacy. of zinc phosphide. So um, I did a 150 kilometre detour one day on the way back from some field work that we'd been doing to talk to a couple of farmers at Birchip in Western Victoria. And uh, one of these guys, he couldn't, he couldn't actually stand still. He was so frustrated with the lack of efficacy he was getting from zinc phosphide. And he said, I keep doing the right thing. I keep putting it out a kilogram per hectare and mice keep eating my crop. And he'd put out four applications and he was still losing his crop. And I, I said, it can't be right. You know, if you're putting out a kilo per hectare, you're putting out 22,000 lethal doses per hectare. <clears throat> now, even in a roaring plague like this, I'd, boy, it'd be exceptional if you had 22,000 mice per hectare. That's a hell of a lot of mice. So in the eight hours it took me to drive home after talking to this guy, <coughs> excuse me, um, we started to think about what might be driving the problem. And I sort of thought, well, if you're a mouse and you're living in a barley stubble, why would you change, if you're successfully eating barley, why would you change to eat wheat with zinc phosphide on it? So we started to investigate whether bait substrate might make a difference to the uptake of zinc phosphide and whether it would, it would enhance the efficacy a bit. So we did some trials and to work out what, what sort of foods my, mice like and we had individual mice in individual cages. We established them on different food backgrounds and then we introduced a, a, a different food to see if they'd transition to it, to see if they'd prefer it. One of the wacky little outcomes from doing this and it happens all the time in science is you discover that mice don't like lentils. Who does? <laughs> it's just, yeah. unless it's in a really good dal, I'm not eating lentils. <laughs> but that sort of surprised me because lentils are really high in protein and you sort of think, oh, wow. You know, there's lots of stuff around animals being able to identify high value foods, but lentils must be wrapped in something that's not very nice. Anyway, the upshot of it was that we identified some, what we thought was some good candidate substrates and we put zinc phosphide on them and we tested them on mice. Now we put zinc phosphide in with the mice at four o'clock in the afternoon, single mice, single cage, floor of the cage completely clean. We monitored them every half hour. We counted the number of toxic grains that they ate. Now by six o'clock, nearly all of the mice in the study had eaten what I would have considered to be a lethal dose of zinc phosphide whether it be on barley, durum wheat, or another bait substrate. And I'm thinking this is going to be Armageddon. Uh, there's stuff in the grey literature that says mice die in two minutes after they've eaten the bait, uh, two minutes to 24 hours. 
I'm sitting there at two o'clock in the morning and nothing had died. I think, what's going on? I gave up and went home at that point, came back in at six o'clock. We had killed only half the number of mice that we expected to kill. We then sent our grains out to be tested by an independent lab and while there was variation between grains, they broadly conformed to the manufacturing standard of 25 grams per kilogram of grain. So that made us really start to ask some questions about what's happening with zinc phosphide and mice. And one of the things that we thought might be happening is because we had been putting zinc phosphide in paddocks for about 20 years, and in South Australia, some farmers do it every year as an insurance. They routinely spread zinc phosphide straight off the back of the cedar. And that's the best way to do it. 24 to 48 hours after the crop has been sown is when the damage happens. Although <laughs> I was talking to a guy last night who said he didn't have any damage in that period, but 10 days later when his canola germinated, it got smashed. So that's something to watch out for at another time. Um, but we thought that what might have been happening was that mice had, we had been selecting for tolerant mice. They hadn't been becoming immune to it, but if you spread zinc phosphide in a paddock and in any population of animals, there'll be some animals that are highly susceptible and some animals that are less susceptible. If you kill all the highly susceptible ones and all of the less susceptible ones die, they would go on to breed more less susceptible animals. So that was, a, that was a logical extension from what we were seeing. And so what we did when we, we went and redid the original toxicity trials for zinc phosphide for mice. And this involves actually putting known doses of zinc phosphide directly into the stomachs of the mice. And so you do a range of doses for a range of mice and we, we use what, uh, an, uh, what's called the OECD up-down protocol. So it's an internationally recognised standard for doing this kind of toxicological study. And, and as, when we go back, we put, we put the doses directly into the stomach of the mouse so there's no issue about whether they ate this or they didn't eat that. And in the same way that you guys would, would drench a sheep, um, except it, it, we go a lot further and actually all the way down into the stomach. So we know that they've got an absolute dose. And from those different doses, you can establish a, essentially a sensitivity curve to the, to the toxin. And what we found was that the mice that we had trialled were half as sensitive as the mice that were trialled in the original study that was done in the USA in the 1980s. And that was the study that we base all of our understanding of zinc phosphide on. So we used mice that had been exposed to zinc phosphide for 20 years, mice that had never been exposed to zinc phosphide, and lab mice. And there was no difference between any of the groups. All of the groups were half as sensitive as we thought they were. So we've then gone on and made some zinc phosphide baits on wheat that we think are the appropriate lethal dose. And we've tested them on mice that are hungry, which is what we think your mice are all the time. Mice that are not hungry because they had food in their cages with them. And we also did the original 25 grams per kilogram dose. Again, when we ran the 25 grams per kilogram, we killed about 50% of the mice. The mice that weren't hungry, that were fed, we killed about, I think it was about 78%. And the mice that were hungry, we killed 98%. So we think that that's, that's a chance for us to make a real difference for you guys. And we've just recently submitted an emergency permit to the APVMA to make bait at 50 grams per kilogram. That's just been approved last Friday night. Monday morning, we put out a press release. On the 30th of May, we'll be in the field in parks testing those 50 gram baits, but you are able to buy those 50 gram baits from bait suppliers if they're manufacturing them. So the, the Grain Producers Australia have done a wonderful job of picking up this information, getting all the bait producers together, submitting an application to the G, to the AVPMA and now we're in a position where we hopefully we can make a difference to you guys and get a really effective knockdown. Next slide please. 
Um, again, the key, one of the key messages from that, and we keep going back, if mice are hungry, they're way more likely to take a lethal dose. We've got some horror footage of a mouse in a cage actually sitting and taking about three minutes to eat an entire grain of zinc phosphide. It's, it's like watching a horror movie. <laughs> but, but what it tells us is they don't actually detect the zinc phosphide um, while they're eating it, which is a really good message. But what the work showed was if a mouse didn't eat a lethal dose, they stopped taking zinc phosphide straight away. So when I'm talking about mice having the best chance of finding a lethal dose, if they only have to find one in amongst all of those other grains, you've got a much better chance of getting a good result. If the, if the bait is under strength, 25 grams per kilogram, and they've got to find two or three, they find one, take it, but by the time they've looked around and eaten other stuff and done this and done that and chased their neighbour, by the time they've found their second grain, which they need to get a lethal dose, they've got a bellyache, and, and they're not going to take that second dose because they've identified the first dose with the, with the bellyache. So one of, one of my colleagues, and he's, he's going to kill me for this, but he calls it the dodgy curry effect. <laughs> and you, you know, you go out, no matter what kind of food it is, by the way, particularly not lentils, but <laughs> if you go out, you have a meal out, come home, you feel sick, might, uh, might not even be related to what you ate, but you're not going back to that restaurant again. And so it's a, re it's a really um, important concept again. So the key message is reduce residual food, give the mice the best chance they can to discover a bait. If you've still got holdings of 25 gram per kilogram bait, I'd still use it, but I'd make sure you give it the best chance that you possibly can to make it work. So reduce that residual food. Next slide, please. Uh, skip over that one, please. <laughs> um, some of the other stuff that we've been doing is, um, is trying to find ways that we can make better predictions about outbreaks. Um, when we first started working on mice and, and GRDC provided funding, we were driving all the way across the country, um, monitoring mice to, to collect data to make predictions or develop mathematical models to make predictions about mouse outbreaks so that we could warn farmers ahead of time about what might be coming. Um, I used to drive three times a year. I would, I would, and I, my, I was responsible for southern New South Wales, northern Victoria, western Victoria, the Adelaide Plains, and the York Peninsula. So three times a year, over 11 days, I would visit 50 farms, do 600 trap nights, um, do, I think it was about 40 or 50 what we call rapid assessment runs with active burrow counts, chew cards. So um, 11 days, 5,000 kilometres, 50 farms, three states, and I did a rubbish job. Absolutely terrible. Because mouse outbreaks are so uh, patchy at the moment because of you know, paddock history and those sorts of things, it was very easy for me to miss what was going on. So what we're developing is a remote mouse monitor that has a, um, a passive infrared sensor in it. When the mouse runs through the tube, the passive infrared sensor goes off, records a time, records a date, puts a one on the card, means that we can actually be actually monitoring changes in mouse activity through time. The idea is to link these into the wireless networks that a lot of farmers have for their weather stations and for their soil moisture probes. And then we can be using the data from the weather station, from the remote monitor, and a range of other things to actually make more spatially explicit um, mathematical models to predict outbreaks. So it gives us a much better opportunity to be accurate with the way we make predictions. So that's a piece of work that we're doing that will hopefully make me redundant. <laughs> So let's jump to the next slide, please. Um, we're also starting to do some work around the genetics of mouse populations and understanding the way genes move through populations to give us a better understanding of, if you like, the architecture of a mouse outbreak and how related different populations are. 
Uh, in particular, the one that I'm interested in is, is finding out whether kin structure actually affects the survival of offspring and, and the rate of, rate of breeding, because we don't have a, a mouse outbreak every time we get a good year. So why, don't, why doesn't that happen? And is it because there's some, um, in, some competition between family groups or, or relationship between populations of mice that actually suppresses the breedings of, of other mice? And so we don't see that exponential rate of increase. So doing some genetic studies, and we've got a terrific PhD student that's on that at the moment, and hopefully that'll give us some information about the way mice interact with each other that might be impacting on the way they breed. Um, it will also help us predict or make some assessment of the feasibility of potential new genetic control strategies. It's always really important to be doing some blue sky stuff because that's where discoveries lie. While there is a real focus on um, using the, the, the tools that we've got now more strategically, we also need to be looking ahead to see if there's anything else out there. One of the real issues that we have is that because zinc phosphide is the only chemical that we have available for us to control mice on a broad scale, we need to use it the best we can. And GRDC have funded some work to look for alternatives. They went through 16,000 potential chemicals to kill mice. They came down with two candidates. One of those is so expensive to make that it becomes not, not a candidate. The other one is so indiscriminate in the way that it kills things, it also becomes not a candidate. So we've got to use, use the tools that we've got really, really well and really appropriately as per the label instructions, but we also should be looking for other alternatives and so we're doing that. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, so the future is, you know, we're going to try and do some pen trials about the uptake of this, these new baits and the, and the relationship with, with other food. Um, we're also going to take some of those trials into the food, into the paddock straight away because there's a great opportunity. There's mice out there. We've got permission to do it now. Let's get it done while we can. We're also starting to work on damage assessments at sowing so that we can actually quantify in economic terms just how much damage mice do at sowing so that it'll help you make decisions about what the thresholds are to control mice. Um, and of course, we're looking at the impacts of different, different cropping practices so that that might give us a, ha a handle on being more strategic about the way you control mice. So for instance, if you knock over your stubble in the lead up to sowing, does that have an impact on mouse populations or is that a good time to bait mice? Uh, lots of people are burning stubbles this year um, in the hope that that will control mice. Uh, not so much, I think, uh, because mouse burrows are about 30 centimetres, 50 centimetres deep. But what it does do is, is take a lot of the cover off and that makes mice a bit more nervous about the way they feed. So maybe if you've burnt your stubble, and I wouldn't advocate burning stubble to control mice, if you're burning stubble so you can get your cedar through, well, use that as an opportunity to spread bait on the back of it the New South Wales DPI put in an emergency permit application to allow you to spread bait on bare ground now. So you burn your stubble, put out your bait, should get a good result. Um, but that's, you know, and again, it's about different, different things that you guys would do normally that might give us an edge in controlling mice. Um, next slide, please. So in summary, Monitor your stubbles, know how many mice there are, reduce your residual food, be prepared to bait, talk to your bait suppliers early to ensure that you've got bait on hand when you need it. Be prepared to spread as soon after you've sown the crop as you possibly can. Continue to monitor after you've baited, particularly this year through the winter. As soon as you start to see the first signs of damage in the spring, that's the time that I'd be thinking about getting out the bait spreader again. And of course, bait is way more effective if it's in the presence of low levels of food. Give the mice the best chance they possibly can of discovering that lethal dose. And of course, none of this is possible without 
the support of your levies through the GRDC. Really important stuff. And that's it. I can take questions now. Is there... um, also, there's some there's some resources there. Yeah, you know, there's a whole heap of really good stuff on the on the mouse landing page of the GRDC website. I'm not sure, um, but we know that it doesn't stay in the animal and the chances of secondary poisoning are low. But I don't know how long it takes to actually move through. I'll talk to you about it later, but we don't think it takes very long for the animal to be not toxic anymore. Okay, and the second question is, in trying to increase mouse uptake of a bait, uh, is there any work being done around lacing the bait with meat based proteins as well? Uh, so <laughs> the answer is not by us, um, but bait producers often say they have some kind of an attractant in the base, in the bait. I don't know what they are. They won't tell us what they are. And there's been lots of work done on attractants over the years and, and there's nothing in the scientific literature that says there's any advantage in it that I know about. So yeah, mice are really good at discovering things, so oh, it's hard to say. No, I, I don't know. Thank you. Just wait for the mic. Steve, the movement of mice from one area to another or one paddock to another, so I bait, my neighbour doesn't, what's the yeah, look, crossover? Our, our recommendation is for any pest animals, the broader scale you can bait on, the better result you're going to get. So if you, can, if you know that you've got a problem with mice and you're able to talk to your neighbours and you can get them to do it at the same time, I think that's a really good idea. One of the things that we've been discovering in these northern systems where livestock are a really large component of the farming system is that pastures, particularly in years after a number of years of drought where you haven't been able to restock, are providing a real shelter habitat for mice. So particularly after that big rainfall event, people were saying, I don't think I've got very many mice left in my stubbles, but my pastures, there's heaps of mice in them. So movement between those habitats is, is a difficult one to, to monitor, but certainly I, if, if I had a, a crop that I'd sow in adjacent to a, to a pasture, I'd be watching for mice moving back into the crop as the pasture go, starts to get run down. Uh, Steve, just to be clear, when you mentioned about just before lunch and just before knock-off time, do you mean they go faster? Uh, sorry, I'll be, I'll be, I wasn't sure. I can't remember. He's talking about the driving. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, uh, and and one of the one of the problems with really good seasons is is often those harvesters those harvests are done you know with relatively short harvest windows. There's you know, there's weather systems coming through all the time in good seasons, and so people push harder in those systems, and because of that, a lot more grain comes out the back. Now, you know, in the olden days, in the olden days when I was farming, you know, we had small seeds boxes, and you know, we're taking crack seed out and putting it in bags and taking it and feeding it to chooks. We're not doing that anymore. These are big flash headers, and they're putting a fair bit of grain through them. But yeah, you know, if you can slow them down, that'll make a difference. The other thing I haven't spoken about is uh, seed destructors, and I suspect that you guys might not be having trouble with herbicide-resistant weeds at the moment. But in some other areas of the country where they've got herbicide resistant weeds, they've got seed destructors on the back of their machines, they're becoming more and more effective over time. The early adopters were a bit, oh, they're not so happy about them. But the idea is that you put the, uh, the chaff component through the, through the seed destroyer and, and turn any of those seeds into flour. Um, so they're like mills in the header. The issue with them was that they steal a lot of horsepower and the early ones started a lot of fires. So that 
as time goes by, they're getting better and, and less grain is going out the back. Yeah, g'day, Steve. Um, preferentially, if you burnt a paddock today, so combine will go through, um, is it better to, I guess, bait straight away after you've burnt as opposed to um, after sowing a day or two later? So that, that's a really good question because putting the fire through is not going to burn the seed that's on the ground. And so even while it's taken all that shelter away and made the mice a little bit nervous about feeding, there's still a lot of alternative stuff there. My argument is that if you could spread the bait straight off the back of the cedar, then the action of the cedar going through is going to bury a lot of that residual grain. And then as mice break out after the cedar's gone through, the bait is the first thing they'll discover. So yeah, great question, and yeah, I would be waiting to go off the back of the cedar if you were doing just a couple of days after the fire. Uh, Steve, um, so I have some questions from the online group. I, for um, I, I forgot about that. We've got 150 <laughs> people online today. Um, so they were asking, what is the name of the chemical that is safe if animals eat dead mice? Okay, so that's a, a, a bit of a loaded question. So the chemical that we're, we're not concerned about secondary poisoning for is zinc phosphide. And there are a number of different labels that describe that, but people need to read the labels and know what the regulations are around the use of those. Zinc phosphide is only registered for use in broad scale agricultural setting. So it's for, available for farmers to spread it in paddocks. It's really, really important that you don't use zinc phosphide around your houses and in those domestic settings. Zinc phosphide produces phosphine gas. That's the gas they use to kill people in their war. It's really dangerous stuff. Don't use it in urban or, or domestic settings because if we get a bad outcome, it'll get pulled and farmers won't have it available to them. Really important. And so further to that, how do you stop native birds eating the grain? Ah, that's a good question. Granivores, granivorous birds. Um, it's spread at three grains per square metre. So that's, that's not a heck of a lot. You're not supposed to spread it within 50 metres of a margin to get away from those shaded areas where granivorous paddocks, pa parrots could discover it. But it's also black, and that's one of the colours that, that parrots find quite difficult to see. I think blue and green are the, are the real winners. They have real troubles with blue and green, but black is also one that's difficult for them to see. So yes, they are sensitive to it, I'm a real birdo, so you know, when, I'm, when I'm wandering around, I'm looking in the sky instead of looking at the ground. It's, it's not good for my work. But I very rarely find parrots that have been impacted by zinc phosphide when we're working in paddocks where, that have been baited. So I'm quite encouraged by that. Similarly, raptors as well. I you know, hardly ever find a dead bird. Um. I have a question here. Stock farmers and businesses that live on the edge of grain and cropping farmers, are there any options for them? We're starting to get that question a lot. Zinc phosphide is not licensed for registered for use in pastures. Um, that's something that maybe they can take up with their different farming groups and make some sort of submission uh, higher up the tree for registration in those in those, um, in those areas. It, it hasn't been a come product problem that's come up before when I've been talking to farmers, but just in the last couple of days, people have been asking me about it. And so I don't really have a good answer for them, I'm afraid. Um, I have a question here about nightly dew on mouse bait. Is okay. there an effect? Yeah, so, so I would be concerned about the um, a potential lack of efficacy if you had three or four millimetres of rain on my boat, certainly I don't think dews would be a problem. I, in, in, in reference to the previous question, I would be reluctant to spread bait into a pasture if you were allowed to, 
because pastures, particularly this year, are really wet environments and the moisture is cycling all the time and that might have an effect on the longevity of the bait. I would certainly, if there was a, a rainfall event that was predicted, I would hold off, spread my bait after the rain. Um, from Peter West, he was wondering if you would <laughs> like um, farmers to be reporting their mouse numbers on mouse uh, alert.org.au. Of course I would, Peter. <laughs> of course I would. And, and it's really cool. So, so mouse alerts are something that we developed in the hope that we'd be able to use the data that was entered into mouse alert to develop really cool mathematical models to predict mouse outbreaks. Farmers are not very good at reporting mice when there aren't any. But what Mouse Alert does is it allows farmers to see what's going on in their district. And if they're putting in data about the number of mice, that will help get to the scenario where farmers are saying, wow, there are actually a hell of a lot of mice in our district. Let's co coordinate our baiting and get a really good result with it. Also, if you look at Mouse Alert, they alert now and you, and you set the parameters to the last six months, it beautifully describes the extent of the mouse outbreak. So it's a really cool piece of kit and there's, in, in deference to Peter, there's a whole lot of other feral species that you can get on and find out about on, on that site and also enter data around it. So it's a really great piece of information. Thanks, Peter, for that question. Um... So there are a few other questions online. Um, do you have time for a couple more do, questions? Do we have time? Yeah, let's get the others up and come back later. And, okay. and I'll stick around afterwards to, to take questions from the room as well. And hopefully, uh, if, if there are questions from either, we, uh, we're on the road for the next three weeks. So <laughs> eventually I'll get home and see my wife and children. But. Um, I'll take questions later. Thanks. Hi, um, my name's Emma Davis. I'm a veterinarian who works for New South Wales DPI and been asked to come and talk to you about um, the effect from a veterinary point of view of the mouse plague um, that's affecting everyone. Um, and thanks, Steve, that was great. Covered a lot of those harder questions that a lot of people have around zinc phosphide baits and are definitely coming up a lot. Now, thankfully, um, if zinc phosphide is used correctly, it's not a uh, risk to our pets. Um, where we have had a couple of reports is when it's used incorrectly, and um, put in piles around silos and things. Um, there's not um, proven um, cases, but some reported cases that some dogs have eaten the piles of grain. Now, I can't see a Kelpie doing that, but if you've got a fat Labrador, that could actually happen. So <laughs> um, please just keep that in mind that um, with all of these baits that you wanna use them according to the label instructions. What vets are seeing right across New South Wales and particularly up north is a huge increase in the number of um, anticoagulant poisonings. So um, those block baits that you put around your house for mouse and rat control. And um, I went out to the um, vets uh, across New South Wales and some of them are seeing eight to ten times as many as they would usually see of these dogs that have had... Um, uh, the, you know, eating the blocks of poison um, themselves. So they've been put around the household and the, and the animals have chewed them up. Um, or that they're eating lots of mice that have been affected by these anticoagulants. So I'll just run through some of that um, so that you guys know what to look for to save and look after your um, animals on property. So we've run through the different kinds of um, baits that are most common um, and the ones for the dogs and also cats actually um, that can risk those guys is these anticoagulant um, blocks. Uh, it's such a common household poison and oftentimes when we see mice we start to put it around a lot and um, really need to keep it in mind where we're putting it because it is attractive to dogs as well. So anticoagulant baits, um, oh is there something? 
Is there a mouse? <laughs> There's a mouse coming to get me. <laughs> that's my pet mouse. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Um, so what anticoagulants do in mice and in other animals is it stops um, the clotting of blood. Particularly, it stops the synthesis of vitamin K in the body. And that's a really um, key part of the clotting cascade. So uh, you might not see, it depends on how much of a dose they get, dogs and cats. It can happen in cats as well. Often the secondary intoxications from eating lots of rodents that have been affected um, is seen in cats. Um, but basically it's related to the dose that they get. So if they eat a whole block of it, they're more likely to get affected. Um, but it does accumulate as well. So if they're eating a couple of mice every day, it can build up in their body systems until the point of it affects them. So it's not necessarily the same day they eat it that you're going to see these symptoms that I'm going to run through. Um, but basically when we stop the blood from clotting, then we start getting bleeding. Um, so one of the first signs you'll see in dogs and cats is weakness, um, just um, going a bit off colour and not um, normal, so it might be lethargic and lying down. Um, and then um, there's, I guess, two ways you can see bleeding, and one is external bleeding, so things like nosebleeds, um, bleeding from um, into the poo and into the, from the rectum, blood in the urine. And also there's also internal bleeding. So they can actually bleed into their lung cavity or into their abdomen. And if it's into their abdomen, they, you might see a swollen belly over time. And that basically, and they'll also be lethargic and maybe pale in their gums as well. And then that will mean that they're actually losing a lot of their blood into their abdomen at that time. And that's um, quite an affected animal. Um, other signs, so the first signs will be lethargic, um, weak, maybe a bit wobbly, um, and then also bleeding gums. So check their gum colour, and if you see any pale, particularly white pale gums, or any bleeding of the gums, basically you want to get these animals to the vet straight away. Because, or if you know that they've eaten the bait, just take it straight to the vet straight away. Because the sooner you get the animal treatment, um, the better likelihood for a good result of the treatment and also the reduction in cost because you won't need like things like blood transfusions and um, which vets are doing um, a lot more at the minute under the current circumstances. Um, another sign of like bleeding into the lungs is difficulty breathing and coughing. So know what baits you put out on your property if you can bring that information to the vet um, with the animal or you know just get the animal to the vet basically and then call up and tell them later on what baits you've got out around the place will help the vet choose their treatment um, and also um, so often i've been haven't been in practice for a bit but um will make the dog vomit it up straight away so if it's if they've just seen you've just eaten it you put it out and it's gone already get them into the vet and the dog, uh, the vet will try and make the dog vomit it up. That's the best outcome. Or sometimes you see like the green um, bait come through the poo. And if you see any of that, just get it to the vet. They'll do a blood test and see if the blood's clotting or not. Uh, and I guess another thing you see is bruising under the skin or swelling. So strange swellings that are coming up on your dog. Um, so, yeah, if you're using rodent baits, and um, I guess everybody is, or your neighbour is, unfortunately, that's a thing that's happening at the minute. Um, just be aware that, you know, just even eating a couple of mice a day has a cumulative effect. Um, ran through that. Uh, yeah, pick up any carcasses that are around the place, so get them out of the way of your animals so that they're not ingesting them. And think about what your neighbours are using as well as what you're using. Um, yeah, I think that's the main the main thing. There's definitely um, they're treating even like right across the state they're treating many many more cases of this. So it's it's a high likelihood of happening in the current circumstances. Uh, and then I guess the other baits we already covered zinc phosphide, um, and uh, we definitely talked to health about that um, earlier this year. Uh, and I had a question before this session about. Um, other animals that might be affected by the mouse plague and I guess feed um, that's spoiled um, for horses, sheep and um, cattle. Horses are particularly susceptible to spoiled feed so if you've got spoiled feed don't be feeding it to your horses, you'll be getting colics and things in them. Um, 
Other things like botulism can happen, but they're not very common. Botulisms when dead carcasses are in the feed and then the t or in silage, and then the toxin gets into animals. Um, that's a neurological symptom. You'd see that in um, nervous signs in horses and stuff. So they're much less common, but they are possible. So if you're seeing anything in stock, just um, talk to your vet as soon as you can and get the animals there. So, yeah. That's me. I can try, yes. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions here. Uh, do anticoagulant baits affect native birds, raptors or parrots? Um, Steve will know more about that than me, but yes, they do, um, which is, again, why you want to be picking up carcasses. Is there a safer domestic pet bait that we should be using? This is a Steve question as well. Oh, okay. I do, we're just treating the... So, um, so in, in, in terms of the question about um, native birds, anticoagulants uh, uh, tend to accumulate in, in higher order, or sorry, uh, higher level predators. Um, and some of the, some of the signs of, of um, intoxication are malformed eggs or fragile eggs. So apart from actual deaths, which, which can occur from secondary poisoning, you also get ongoing effects in, in, in egg production and those sorts of things in animals that haven't been killed by the toxin. In terms of rodent baits that are safer for pets, I don't think there are any, no. Thank you. Yeah, question. How long does it take? Uh, it, no, it doesn't really. So um, if they get a sub-lethal dose, um, they might um, recover over time, but usually you'll just see those signs of like it, um, its clotting is affected for a really long time. So it might just be bleeding a little bit, but it'll continue to bleed. So it might just be sick and, and wax, you know, sl more slowly, but you'll probably still get an animal that does bleed out. So you do want to um, just be really aware of it, those first signs. If you replace the vitamin K in the animal, then you get the clotting back really quickly. So vitamin K is like a tablet form. It's a bit crazy expensive the tablets um especially if you have a big dog but it's um it's it's what they need basically so they um any animal that's not bleeding out um on the table or lost all its blood into its abdomen and needs a blood transfusion um they will um start the clotting up again by giving the vitamin k at an appropriate dose and it's quite a long course like a 30 day course of vitamin k that you need to keep that in the system for it to get out of their system and, and regenerate blood cells and things um, the mention of um, contamination in hay and fodder stored fodder you're talking about blokes having to destroy it at what level do we have to destroy it like just dry mouse shit's not going to Kill them, it's not botulism in that or not? No, there's not botulism in the faeces, it's more in the carcasses. Um, yeah, yeah we, we've just started to ask some questions about um, fodder storages um, and it's come about because some of the government departments are wanting to um, establish a more sustainable way of, of, of uh, storing fodder in terms of drought resilience. And so one of the things that we want to focus on is just what is contaminated um, fodder. And if mice have been in it, does that really matter? And what are the diseases that are there? So there's some questions that we're going to be hopefully asking over the next couple of years and using some really cool genetic techniques to actually uh, identify those disease profiles and what the impacts might be. So. Yeah, all right, uh, mice are carrying some kinds of lepto. Are they the lepto that gets passed on to livestock? We don't know fully yet, but the, the recommendation at the moment is be careful. In terms of human health, which we're going to talk about in a minute, if you're, if you're handling hay that's been uh, contaminated by mice, I'd be wearing a mask, I'd be wearing gloves. Just a question um, for friends who live in town. 
Um, where we live in Cumnock, um, there's a fair proportion of numbers, or high, a lot of numbers for mice in town. What's the best way for someone in town to keep the population down to a livable <laughs> number? Uh, look, this is a uh, this is a really good question because we've we've talked about the economic impact and 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 the, uh, and the problems that you guys have in your paddocks, but one of the real sleepers and 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 New South Wales Health are going to talk about it in a minute is the psychological impact of living with mice day in day out and that's what sort of one of the really unquantified impacts of the mouse outbreak, but in terms of making your house mouse proof or keeping them out. Um, and <laughs> I can see Amanda smiling here because we've, we've been talking about it as we go around in the car and she says, oh, I've just done this. And I said, that works? And she, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I say shove steel wool into all the cracks where pipes come in through houses, use door seals and all of those things. Amanda's been using Space Invader, you know, stuff you buy from the hardware stores that you spray into the gaps and it expands when you spray it in and fills up all the spaces. Uh, I, reckon the, I reckon the mice eat that. Yeah, they do. Amanda, Amanda reckons that not, a, not Amanda's mice. Let's breed your mice. <laughs> um, the, the other one is uh, the people were telling me last night that they couldn't get steel wool without soap in it. They shoved the stuff with soap into the gaps and the mice loved the soap and they pulled it all out again. So, But yeah, block up all the holes. I, I would be using traps inside. I know it's a horrible job every day to take the mice out, but mm. at least if you're using traps inside, you don't have those poisoning issues and you don't have the issues with them going into wall cavities and those sorts of things to die and stinking the house out. But the other thing, of course, is remove all the food sources from around the house. So if you've got ovaries, if you've got chickens, if you've got dogs, you know, clean up the spilt food in, underneath ovaries. Clean. I know it's really difficult with chickens, but don't leave bags of food around. Mow your grass, keep the grass short around the house. Heaven forbid if you don't have a Labrador and it doesn't eat all, your, all its food at night, pick up the uneaten food. So get all of those things that attract mice away from the house. I have to say, my um, if a mouse runs out, my reaction and response is going to be completely disproportionate to the size of the mouse and me. But I just, I feel like I'm going to have to, can I stand and just look? It's gone. Okay, don't let it attack me. <laughs> okay, and I know it's completely ridiculous, but um, yeah, I live in town and the mice are further west and the mice have been in my house. So one thing I have um, managed to get over this, uh, throughout this mouse um, plague is the fact that I have to, I can't keep buying traps, so I couldn't just keep throwing everything out. So um, I have finally, I'm brave enough to get rid of the mouse. I do have um, some slides and I did anticipate this would be quite an interactive um, bit of a chit chat, but uh, given there's people on the webinar, we'll try and stick to the slides. They're really, um, the information that I wanna share is, um, is pretty general in nature and it's stuff that you are, I'm sure, all very well aware of. So just starting with an introduction, my name's Priscilla Stanley and I'm the Director of Public Health for uh, Western New South Wales and I also cover out to far west. Um, our people, anyone who's got friends out in the far west, they don't have this mouse problem um, and they're quite keen to keep it uh, into, in western New South Wales. I'm very kind of them. So um, I, whilst I work in health, I'm sure you can all appreciate there's very, there's a lot of um, areas in health. Mental health is its own area in particular, but um, Steve has al already mentioned that the impact of um, this mouse plague on uh, people's mental health is uh, being recognised and there are uh, resources out there for for people in our communities. It's, um, but working in public health, it is especially uh, significant given that we have gone in our communities, we've gone from drought and the terrible dust storms through to experiencing COVID-19, um, which is ongoing and hasn't gone away, just in case you think it has. 
Um, unfortunately, in a webinar I attended the other day, the bad news with COVID is they anticipate it's going to be around for decades. Um, so I will unashamedly just use this opportunity to tell everyone to please consider being vaccinated for uh, COVID-19. Um, and now we're on the back of uh, the pandemic, we're now looking at this mouse plague, which, so in public health, you probably didn't hear of us or know we existed until the pandemic um, came about. And it was, wow, these guys that um, sit, we, we, I'm in Dubbo, I've got staff in Bathurst and Broken Hill. Um, now we actually know what you do. So we've been affectionately coined disease detectives. Um, uh, yeah, that's fair enough. The contact tracing that was needed during COVID was quite extraordinary and um, that is, that's the work we do best. But what we also do in public health is we look at diseases that, um, uh, that um, go from animals to humans because they can be quite significant. So they're known as zoonotic diseases. And uh, when the mouse numbers started increasing towards the end of last year and then earlier this year, it came to my attention um, uh, initially with the use of zinc phosphide. We might move on to the next slide. Sorry, I, I, I may talk, um, I may not talk to the slides. So they are in the background. So uh, the initial interest from human health with the mouse, increase in mouse numbers was related to the use of baits. So um, the message from us in health is just reinforcing exactly what Steve said, please read the um, directions for use and uh, use those baits in accordance to those directions. The use of zinc, zinc phosphide in the home is not recommended. And at this point in time, we haven't seen a, a terrible outcome, as in a fatality, but we have had, in, had, we have had people admitted to hospital following the use of zinc phosphide in their homes. So it is not and should not be used in those circumstances. So mice, um, unfortunately, they do carry um, diseases and those diseases can um, be transferred to humans either directly or indirectly. So um, from the handling of the, the carcass, the mouse itself, or through contaminated soil or water. Um, some of the steps uh, we've really, it's been talked about. So attempting to minimise that contact with the rodent is, um, is obvious. Although I'm sure there's probably some country kids and I remember this when I was growing up and we had a mouse plague back in, I suppose it was probably the eighties. Um, we used to love catching the mice and um, disposing of them in our methods. Um, that was myself and my siblings. So just um, that's not recommended, touching um, the mice and um, discarding of them or letting your kids do whatever they want to do with them. Um, we have had reports in the district of people, um, especially vulnerable people, being bitten by mice. So taking steps um, as best we can to, to prevent that through to all your cleaning um, and disinfection. And that's, that's a constant. It's a constantly wiping over your surfaces, constantly cleaning um, your crockery, your knives and forks, et cetera, and also your bed linen. Um, cleaning of the carcasses and al also um, we've had or we've seen through social media and we in public health have received phone calls about your tanks being contaminated with um, the rodents and baits and poisonings have already been talked about. So just on to the next slide. Some of the diseases in particular, oh, there's the mouse poking out through the hole. <laughs> next slide is hopefully talking about the diseases that we are particularly concerned about. And we've already mentioned leptospirosis. So lepto, um, all of these diseases can often start reasonably mild. Um, and if you're lucky, it stays mild. If you're unlucky, um, to, uh, have been unlucky enough to have acquired one of these diseases, they can progress to quite a serious illness. And there are um, cases where it, some of these diseases have been fatal. So leptospirosis is the one that we've seen across New South Wales have an, um, a rise in numbers. Uh, in Western New South Wales, we don't often see cases of lepto in your, your normal period of time. But um, with the increase in rodents, we have uh, received reports and all of the reports of cases of lepto 
uh, have had links with um, with masks. So um, the LCMV, this was a new one um, that I only discovered this year. I hadn't hadn't heard of this lymphocytic choreomeningitis, and um, simply because with the LCM, it's usually diagnosed. It's not a notifiable condition, which means it's not. It doesn't have to get reported to us in the public health unit, but it's normally diagnosed just on clinical presentation. So if you're crook enough to go to the doctor, that might be something that they do diagnose you with. But we, um, this year working with the labs down in Sydney, we're able to get a positive diagnosis for a case out our way. And we're actually in the process of investigating someone else. It's pretty nasty, so it gives pretty bad headaches and you get that real meningitis um, symptoms where you don't like bright light and you have you know, that really se severe um, headache. So it could be quite serious. You may end up in hospital for a few days. There's another disease called rat bite fever. We haven't seen any cases of that and let's hope we don't. And then other gastrointestinal infections that we're likely to see associated with mice is your salmonella. But you can also see um, probably Campylobacter or um, crypto associated with, the, with increase in rodents. Um, so the symptoms, as I've mentioned, may vary slightly with each of those diseases. And obviously the treatment is also something that um, will vary depending on what your diagnosis is. So probably the most important point there is if you don't feel right, please go to your doctor and also let your doctor know that you have had contact with rodents. Um, I'm sure you can appreciate being a medical professional that sometimes it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. So um, in the industry that you all work, there are a number of zoonotic diseases that we would consider, um, but at, at the current time with the increase in rodent numbers, it's important just to mention to your GP. On to the next slide. So minimising the risk, we've talked about that um, you know, covering up holes or sealing any holes or gaps in your house. You know, your food uh, sources, etc. I've heard stories that the rodents have eaten through Tupperware, so um, Tupperware need to get extra, um, extra thick Tupperware. So it, I mean, it's just doing the best you can to take away that food source. And this is I'm talking in the household now, obviously. Um, don't set your mouse traps near food food prep areas. Um, if you do get bitten by mice, it's like anything really that um, if you're bitten by any animal, make sure you clean the area, um, particularly with soap and water. There may be a need to have some antibiotic creams, but that's um, going to be dependent on the bite and um, on recommendations from a general practitioner. Uh, you may need a tetanus shot if you haven't had tetanus, especially if it's drawn blood, if you haven't had a tetanus shot for a while. It's um, not a bad idea just to go into your GP and get that at the same time time um, and obviously if there's any break in your skin it's important just to watch out for any other skin infection that might develop so that's all uh, just if it, um, it gets red and a um, bit sore and then cleaning around the house I've talked about that with disinfectant or a bleach solution um, on to the next slide we have um, more steps to minimise the risk, so the cleaning up of the rodents. Uh, here we also have a point, and it's on the sheet that has been handed out, some um, tips on cleaning your rainwater tanks, if that is your water source. Um, it's important if you do think it's uh, contaminated with rodents to boil your water before consuming. Um, if it's in a particular bad shape, like there's lots of mice in there, you may need to drain it. And also just look at what sludge might be in the bottom of your tank and um, try and get rid of that. So you can treat the water um, with chlorine as has, is described in the fact sheet. Um, and obviously the public health unit are available for um, information and advice on how to treat water tanks. Um, and I've talked about the, the baits, and I'll just reinforce that again. Please use those baits in accordance with the instructions. And I think that might be the last slide. Excellent. And just some resources that are available. But New South Wales Health and the Public Health Unit are always happy to take phone calls, so don't hesitate to give us a call if you need anything. Thanks. Oh, questions. I was hoping to get out scot-free without any questions. <laughs> I thought Steve knows so much more about masks than what I do. <laughs> um, you mentioned about... Sorry. Do you mind if you 
When you mention about avoiding or minimising chances of uh, mouse bite, rat bite, um, I had something run across. I sleep, sleep with cloth over my head so I don't get light in my eyes. And I felt a mouse run across <laughs> my head, not on my skin though. Mm. Um, but I just fear that while I'm asleep, maybe I could get bitten. Mm. So how would I minimise? Can I spray myself with some AeroGuard, which I don't like, but... No, AeroGuard won't. As far as I know, I don't think AeroGuard's going to do anything against the mice. It's, I mean, really, it's just trying to... And I, I know the mice have been found in people's beds and even um, I've heard stories of rats. It, it's... Well, I've got no magic solution, Steve, do you? Look, the, the only, <laughs> only other one I've heard is that you know, people used to put their dining table... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> People used to put their dining table legs in buckets, buckets. of water. Mm. Uh, if you've got legs on your bed, you might be able to put your legs of your bed in buckets of water and stop them getting up, but they're going to come off the curtains and all sorts of places. Um, yeah, there's no advice mm. there. But, but probably if you're not uh, swatting them mm. or chasing them or trying to handle them, you're a lot less chance of being bitten. Yeah, that's right. Um... I didn't mention in the slides, but it was mentioned um, previously about the use of PPE. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying you're not a great group. Um, it's not a great occupation for the use of PPE. It is really important to wear and use PPE. Um, so the use of gloves, the use of masks, the use of goggles is actually really great barriers to um, help protect you from diseases like this. And just keep in mind, these diseases can put you in bed for weeks on end, and that means that you're not out there working and being able to do your job. So the use of PPE in, um, in your line of work is incredibly important, as well as um, hand hygiene. So Hand washing is something that those of us in public health have, um, we, we got quite used to reminding everyone about hand hygiene last year, of which it's um, interestingly the amount of um, outbreaks associated, uh, gastro outbreaks um, in childcare centres, et cetera, were hugely decreased last year. And there were still kids in childcare. It wasn't because there weren't any children. The, um, it just demonstrates the, how effective hand hygiene is we, um, we in health who are particularly interested in public health and infection prevention and control, we, um, we know how important just that simple step of using um, running water and soap, if you can, that's the best method, or the hand sanitizer that's really available pretty much anywhere nowadays. Thanks to COVID, you can pick it up at, um, at most shops. Thank you. Oh, more. Okay. I, have one, I have one question from you, uh, for you, sorry. Uh, there, there's a question is, what if you can't get to the doctors and we live in the country and there are not enough doctors? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I Look, there's lots of other options and I think COVID really highlighted the other options that are available. So telehealth is available. There are... Um, there are that it's, I don't want to get into that, not enough doctors available. I work in public health and I'm just interested in um, this disease process. But I do know and I do appreciate that it is difficult to access um, medical professionals. At the very least, if you have concerns, um, I'm happy if you contact the public health unit and we can help um, facilitate contact with a GP. Are there an increase of allergy symptoms uh, with mice? Oh, not that I know of, but I can't. Um, I suppose they could be dusty and. Yeah. That's... <laughs> so there's a bit of a bit of input from the back of the audience here that that I didn't know about. And I, but but farmers have been reporting when they've been handling um, hay and bags that have been affected by. Uh, mice that there's a thing called mouse mite and they actually come up with small welts like a like a bite on their stomach yeah I didn't know about it either yeah, yeah. I, I got yelled at for sitting in on the hay bales the other day by my m minders um, 
I haven't encountered it when I've been handling mice, and I handle lots and lots of mice, but I believe it is a thing in these communities and, and, and storages, and there's lots of nodding around the room. It suggests there are some little bites and so forth. Just is since, safe? just since the last rain event, sort of eight days ago, whatever it was, the 20 mils that most people got, um, on the dead carcasses, fresh ones, there's now between 15 to 20 fleas per mouse right. um, in this area. Are you talking about a bite on you? It's probably more fleas, but the risk that probably people should be aware of to dogs, to cats, and then the other disease vectors on fleas. Absolutely, and you know, when we're talking about mouse mite, it pro probably these critters that are coming out of those storages and you know, fodder and so forth are mites that were on the mice but are no longer there now. And yes, you're absolutely right. Mice do carry fleas. You know, we, we don't commonly see them, but they are certainly carriers of fleas and those sorts of things. So absolutely, again, all of those basic rules about hygiene are really important. Um, just for all the listeners online, um, the fact sheet that Priscilla from Health just referenced is able to be found on the DPI website, so dpi.nsw.gov.au forward slash mice. You will find it there. Oh, sorry, more questions. It's okay, I'm just going through the online ones. Um, so Barbara asks, phosphides, can they harm marsupial mice? Okay. <laughs> um, that, look, that's a really good question. Um, in terms of granivorous, granivorous natives, I, I don't know of very many or any that are associated with cropping systems and so the chances would be very low. There are a whole suite of marsupial small mammals that aren't mice, so Antichinus and Sminthopsis or Dunarts, um, and they're terrific little critters. They're, they're about the size of a mouse. They've got a pouch. You go, oh my God, a mouse with a pouch, and they have, they have up to eight offspring per year. But these guys are terrific little insectivores. So the chances of those them encountering phosphide on grain are very, very low, but terrific in your environment. Um, we joke about if Sminthopsis were as big as cats, humans would be extinct because they, they're fantastic little critters and once they get hold of your finger, they don't, never let go. But, but yeah, no, thankfully, um, there shouldn't be an impact. Um, uh Chris has been using a lot of coagulant type poisons. He's noticed that there's bright green vermin droppings around. And he just wanted to know if they uh, were resistant to the poison or if they were just passing it through their system before dying. Yeah, so one of the things about anticoagulants is it takes a few days for them to die and they may continue to eat it. The second generation anticoagulants, they only need one feed to kill them. But if they continue to eat it, they'll shed it in the time while they're actually dying. And those faeces are a source of secondary poisoning for animals that eat those faeces as well. So you need to be very careful. If you've seen green poo around, sweep it up, put it in the bin, get rid of it if you possibly can. There are a lot of old wives tales on my chat at the moment. <laughs> um, someone has suggested a coarse layer of salt between the hay bales to stop the mice. Uh, what about trapping and what what can people do about all this fodder, you know, to save it, I guess? Yeah, again, that's the subject of some work that we're starting to do over the next few years. Um, our focus historically has been protecting or minimising the damage to crops, and there's been a lot less focus on, on fodder storages. Uh, we're hearing stories of, of farmers in burying in high, entire haystacks to try and protect it from mice, and there are issues associated with all of these things that we do. At the moment, I'm having trouble grappling with the ideas about how to protect these fodder storages. One farmer we spoke to the other day, big, great big wide hay shed, uh, 16 wide, eight high. He was pulling out the outside bales that were affected 
by the mice, loading his truck, sending those off for sale, the ones inside that weren't affected, and then putting the outside bales back. So that to help continue to protect those inside bales, really labour intensive, but might help. Another wives' tale, spreading chilli sauce around the home. Yeah, I'm not going with that. <laughs> um, how far do mice travel? If a neighbour is baiting, can the mice travel to your home? Uh, look, so we, we've got, you know, we, we put ra radio transmitters on mice. They weigh 0.4 of a gram and you can track them around for about 24 or 25 days. They're really cool pieces of kit. Um, you get movements of 100, 200 metres in a night. But remember, moving for a mouse is a dangerous thing to do, so they're not going to do it unless they're forced to do it. They don't actually choose to go over there. Um, mice that are poisoned by zinc phosphide actually sort of slow down a lot. They don't tend to move around very much. Um, and, and as the symptoms come on, they, they go downhill quite quickly. Then they look to start to recover. And then half an hour before they got, die, they go downhill again very quickly. And that's basically total organ failure kicking in. So mice that are poisoned by zinc phosphide, probably not so much movement. Mice or, or rodents that are poisoned by anticoagulants, we know a bit less about, but we, we think that that might influence the way they move and they might range over a slightly greater area. But certainly, you know, if you're baiting in a paddock using zinc phosphide, you know, I haven't heard reports of them all going next door or into people's houses. Um, and this is a question for Priscilla, I think. Um, Children who have been scared and traumatised by excessive mice in homes, are there any resources or interactive apps that can be used for, to help parents um, in this instance? I, I actually don't. I actually don't know, to be honest. I could contact my colleagues in mental health, but I'm sure there'd be some strategies like anything that kids are traumatised to. You can you know, try and... Um, there'd be some strategies to to assist with that. Okay, do you want to wrap it up? technology. Um, I'd like to thank everybody at home for coming along today. I hope that it's been a very informative session. It's been very useful for me. It's clarified some misconceptions. Thankfully, I don't have to share my chilli sauce with the mice anymore, so um, my dinner's safe there. Um, for everybody in the room, thank you very much. And um, I just hope that you do log on to the DPR website. I hope that you keep on top of all the information that's been coming this week. We certainly have been bombarded with a lot of information. Some of it's very confusing. Some, and I think Steve's been a fantastic presenter and I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule. Like, it's amazing. He's like a pop star of the mice world and um, the way he's been travelling around. Um, thank you very much for people coming along today. We only had five days to organise this day. Those in Cumlock, there's another one on May the 24th, so you can come along and fill in the gaps that you missed. Um, yeah, thank you very much for everyone. Thank you to the DPI, LLS, Priscilla, Emma, everybody. And um, good luck in your fight against the mice. We will win. Thank you. <laughs>